Good afternoon, everybody. Today we welcome you to another new session of BWHR Voices. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Neeru Kumar, Padma Shri 2021. She's also a medical doctor and also the national icon of Election Commission of India. Dr. Neeru, people would also be very keen on knowing that she's also the founder of CEO, uh, Ask Insights, which is a diversity and inclusion consulting organization. Dr. Neeru, we welcome you on board and it will be a pleasure for us to be speaking to you on the topic PWD inclusion scenario in workplaces today. Uh, Dr. Neeru, some some. Uh, kind words from your end. How do you feel, and what exactly you think you're bringing on board today into our, into this discussion? Thank you, Sugandh. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. First of all, I'd like to say that the very fact that we are having a conversation on uh, inclusion of people with disabilities that itself is a matter of pride and celebration, right? Because it's only recently that people have really started talking about this subject and the momentum is picking up. So I think our conversation today is part of that momentum and that wave that is picking up. And I would like to contribute my bit to it by giving any information or any answer to any question that you may have. We'll be happy to pose questions to you. Also, all those people who will be hearing this uh session uh, even they might be having certain questions so to everybody who will be hearing it and if you have any queries i would request you that once you hear the session you can actually post your questions in our linkedin uh, and on our twitter as well tagging dr neeru and she'll be happy to answer all your queries so uh, just to give a brief backdrop of what we'll be discussing uh, I feel that uh, DNI is increasingly becoming a conversational point across India Inc. That's the gap between intent and the action has actually come out now. 67% of C-suit executives believe that they've built a supportive workplace that enables their disabled employees to thrive, while the right technology, environment, and support only 41% of employees with disability, you know, actually agree to the fact that organizations are now uh, pulling up, uh, pulling up their socks and actually working towards their inclusion within the organization. 76% of employees with disabilities and 80% of executives with disabilities, though they're not fully open about their disabilities at work, because as you might agree, there's still certain apprehensions on how they'll be accepted in the society and amongst their working peers. Dr. Nero, you've been a pioneer in the space of DNA in India. What, according to you, has been the status of inclusion of people with disabilities till now? And how do you see and how can you claim that, you know, we are onto the path of a changing scenario now? Yeah. So, you know, I'd like to begin by saying, Sugant, that um, I myself have a disability and I got polio in early childhood. So okay. I have been literally waiting for the day where the conversation would start in a meaningful way. Uh, about 15 years back, when I started Ask Insights and the work in diversity and inclusion, diversity to the people of India meant only gender. Right. To the extent that we would say, we have diversity in our team, meaning we have women in our team, or we have a diversity candidate. And it was very important. The conversation of gender was very important and still is. And I have done enormous work in the space of gender by, um, you know, talking to people about gender intelligence, not gender sensitization, but gender intelligence. And slowly it started widening to the LGBTQ community and to different ethnic groups conversation. Mm -hmm. For disability, we have barely started, barely started. Yeah. Because I think disability was an area people were apprehensive about. The first apprehension was creating accessible workplaces, which would mean mm -hmm. a total revamping of the infrastructure and the buildings. And the second apprehension was all the sensitivities that are involved around disability. Nobody wants to make a mistake. Nobody wants to offend anybody or right. be legally, socially wrong in how they are interacting. And then, not, uh, not the least, people were also worried about the performance of people with disabilities. Would they need too much accommodation? Would they be able to perform? 
So with a list of all of these apprehensions, I think we have, like I said, we have just started. And even now, there are very few organizations who have meaningfully started hiring and engaging people with disabilities. We're going to have a conference on 13th of March in partnership with Business World, and we're calling it Disability Positive. The tagline of our conference is enabling organizations to launch their disability initiatives because we want to handhold them. We want to handhold them in giving up that fear. We want them to have all the information that they need so that they get the confidence to go ahead and launch the good intent that they already have. So do you feel I will just... At the starting point and at a very nascent stage of working towards disability, or you feel that, you know, in comparison to previous times, we've come a long way? No, we haven't come a long way at all. Okay. You know, see, I, I have grown up uh, in a place in, in India where it's right from accessibility to people understanding to the disability etiquette, mm -hmm. it was completely, completely lacking. You know, now the only thing that has changed is that there is intent. There is intent. Awareness is still a long way to go. And actual reasonable accommodations, actual changes, I think, will take a few years before we catch up. Okay. So uh, it is also noted, Dr. Nero, that workplaces are now opening doors to PWDs. Earlier, there were also apprehensions in minds of employers that even if, you know, they, they forget the part that, you know, they are physically challenged or disabled, but they only hire basis somebody's talent and skills. But there were apprehensions on the kind of infrastructure if they can provide them or not. Right. So as an employer, what do you think an employer needs to keep in mind in order to provide a seamless inclusion experience to their employees? Yeah. So I would say a few things to keep in mind. We spoke mm -hmm. about ac accessibility. Mm -hmm. Now, accessibility needs to be very authentic. Uh, for example, I've done a great deal of work with the Election Commission of India in making polling booths accessible for everyone for people with disabilities. Okay. And when we started doing the work, we found that there were several barriers. Creating just a ramp is not enough. Mm -hmm. You have to, the, the thought has to start from the, per, from the entry, from the person reaching the door. Right. And the accessibility of the entry. So suppose there are barriers or, you know, when you have those security barriers. Right. How will a person of disability navigate that? And then right inside, will the wheelchair be good on that road, on that particular road? So all that has to be kept in mind. I'm not saying that we are looking at only locomotor disabilities. I'll talk about the other form of disabilities also. But right now, to begin with, I'm talking about locomotor. Right. And then once you go in, suppose there is a uh, like a big gadda uh, in between the ramp and the road. That's, that has to be seen. Suppose the ramp is very steep. Mm -hmm. or very slip, that has to be seen. I cannot tell you the number of ramps that I have been asked to go up, which was just not possible to go up, you know. Right now, in fact, right now, I'm coming from a building where they had a so-called ramp. And right on top of the ramp, they had put a very big planter. So the distance in which I had, I, I, I use a mobility scooter. The distance okay. with which I had to, after climbing the ramp to turn around, was nil. So, so with the result that I had to ask my driver to pick up the scooter and keep it down and I climbed down the steps. And this has happened numerous times because people are still not aware of the intricacies of how a ramp should be. Do you think so uh, having such an infrastructure within an organization is only a matter of tokenism and checklists today where they do not actually feel as to what exactly are they curating? Is it according to the needs and wants of the person with disability? Or do you think, you know, they're just, they're just making it as a part of it so that they can put it in their policies and their organizational framework that, you know, we are PWD friendly? You know, I think uh, large organizations will not do that because 
yeah, it's in the area of disability. There might be tokenism in a lot of other areas of TNI. But for disability, they will not do that because they know of the risk involved. In okay. in today's day, I think they will rather, I'm talking about multinationals, big organizations. They would rather stay away from it. And they are openly, I work, I partner with a lot of organizations. And mm-hmm. many like PepsiCo, Google, Amazon, Flipkart, Tata Group, Aditya Birla Group, you know. And many of them are saying we're not yet ready. They're openly and frankly saying we're not yet ready because they know they can't launch it in a way that is not authentic. Hmm. So the right, right way to go about it, the right way to go about it is to first have an audit of the premises. You first do a complete audit of the premises, and then the the expert gives you the recommendations. And, and you have to choose the right expert who gives you the recommendations as to how to make that place accessible. If you don't, if you just create a, call an architect and create a ramp, that is going to be tokenism. And if anybody is doing that, well, they'll soon realize it won't work. Mm. Yeah. And then I said accessibility is not only for locomotive. There are other forms of accessibility, which is digital accessibility for hearing impaired, for visual impaired people, use of Braille, using of technology, which is disability friendly. All of that has also then to be done alongside. You can't do just one aspect. But then, Dr. Nero, do you think, is it still, you know, if organizations, such big organizations are openly claiming that that they're not yet ready, how can you expect or how can we expect people from the PWD group to be ready in order to, you know, accept their disability and just, you know, get hired basis talent, wherein deep down they know that, you know, organizations are openly claiming that they're just not ready in terms of infrastructure to accommodate them. I know it's very discouraging. It's really discouraging. And when you have a conversation with people with disabilities, you'll hear so many angsts. You'll hear them talk about how painful it is. And if you hear their lived experience, uh, you'll also hear what a lot of struggle they've all gone through or we've all gone through to be to to just merely survive or, you know, to go to workplaces, to go to social places, to go to public places. I still remember that I went for a trade fair and I was standing on the line for a long, long time. And my son went and approached the guard and said, uh, can she go out of line? And the guard said, why do you come? Take her back home. You know, and, and that's the kind of feeling I lived with that maybe I'm not entitled to go everywhere. Maybe I should not expect especially entertainment places, I should not expect. It's enough if I go to my educational institute. That's all I can think of or ask for. And I think there are a lot of people who feel like that. And to be included in everything, whether it is entertainment, whether it is uh, voting or anything else, to be included in everything requires the society, the infrastructure, organization, leaders to assure them that they are a valuable part of the country, they are a valuable part of society, and all reasonable accommodations, it's called reasonable accommodation, all reasonable accommodations will be done to include them. Like I said, it's going to take time. No, of course, it's a time-taking process. We cannot expect changes to happen overnight. Do you think, is there a business case, you know, if hiring PWDs or it is more of social inclusion perspective? Because usually we hear employers speaking, you know, let's hire basis talent, not basis somebody's sexual preferences or disabilities because we need talent on board. So do you think hiring them is, is part of the social inclusion perspective that companies are carrying today? You know, you've raised a very good point because we talk about a theme of equity. Now, we talk about it. I, I've been doing a lot of this conversation vis-a-vis gender, but it also applies to people with disabilities. What is equity? Equity is, one, taking care of specific needs, the accessibility that we've been talking about. And second, making up for the backlog of the past. So I often say that I, when I went entered medical college, I didn't take use of the disability quota. 
I wrote the UPSC exam. I didn't take use of the disability quota. Today, yeah. I think I was foolish. And when I address people with disabilities, I tell them that I was foolish. And I say that the lived experience of people with disabilities has had so much struggle. Maybe they couldn't reach their classes. Maybe when others were studying, they had they were in the hospitals. And maybe it took them much longer to reach their colleges, schools. And that took away valuable time when they were studying. That backlog of the past has to be taken care of. And that equity has to be provided. So when we talk about merit, one, our idea of merit may be a little limited. Second, we shouldn't miss the equity part of it, right? So, but does that mean you compromise on merit? No. No. You can't do that. You can't do that. So, what you do is that you invite more resumes. You look at the job description. You look at the job roles, which are ready to invite people with disabilities. and Maybe in that role, you're also looking at abled people. By the way, just for the terminology, you don't say normal people. You say abled people. Abled, right? So you're also looking at abled people. And equity means you don't compromise on merit. But if it is a 90-20 fit, then you take the person with disability. Or in women, I say 19-20 fit. For disability, because we really want to encourage the movement, I would say a 15-20 fit. If there is a difference of that much, please go ahead and do it because we want that kind of representation. Now, about the business case. Here comes the point of leveraging diversity of thought. See, people with disabilities have gone through a lot of struggle. And struggle is actually a precursor of success because struggle wires your brain to find solutions. So the ability they have of resilience, of finding solutions out of the box thinking. You have to, you have no choice, you have to. You know, I'll give you an example. I wear a big support in my leg and I travel a lot. Hmm? Uh, at times it breaks, it's an equipment, right? And it breaks. In one of my journeys, it broke and I had a session with leadership with about 50 people attending and I was out of town, what do I do now? So the, the screw had actually come out. I thought for a moment, I took out the tape out of my petticoat, put it in that hole, tied a knot and went for the work. Because I had no other rope, nothing else. So the innovation becomes a part of your life with disability. And that it is does. the innovation. And that is the innovation we can leverage for actually better business results. And the entire conversation today about leveraging diversity of thought is exactly that, that different groups brings different perspectives. You know, there is a research by Professor Scott Page which says, talks about the mental toolbox. It says your core qualification and your knowledge is only one part of it. The other is your problem solving skills. If you're able to do that, combine this two, your mental toolbox becomes much larger. And then diversity becomes as important as what you call merit. But don't you think, Dr. Nehru, uh, in comparison to able people, other able people, the people from PWDs have to actually work in, work in an extra mile hard in order to show their acumen. You know, it was pure sense of uh, common sense that you showed at the time wherein you just took out the tape and, you know, you had the zeal to attend the session. You know, you used presence of mind. But... If we see from an employer's standpoint, an employer might also feel and employees might also feel that, you know, you're working an extra mile in order to prove your acumen so that people just don't see you as, you know, a person from PWD town while you are also applying your common sense. So do you think it's a case with everybody from this segment that you, they have to actually work extra hard in order to prove their acumen? Yes. Most of them, yes. Because it, this creates a sense of pressure as well at times. It does. Many times it may be unconscious. You don't realize it, but your driving force is that you don't become irrelevant. Right. 
That's a, that's a very major part of the psyche which drives the person to work, 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 work. At no point in life do you want to become irrelevant. And there are some very self-respecting people with disabilities who say, I want to be a valuable part of my family and society forever. And for that, I will work twice and thrice as hard to be accepted. And let's face it, the lived experience of people with disabilities is all is most of the time that they have to go through a lot of struggle. And many of them say, I'll take it in my stride. It's okay, but I can't give up the work. And especially if they get a work through a lot of struggle, if they get hired through a lot of struggle, they say, doesn't matter. I'll put up with all those maybe swelling in my feet or pain somewhere or something else. And I'm still going to go ahead. And many times they don't even talk about it. Nobody knows except they themselves and their family members. Right. And as I rightly and said, that, it's, it's all in the work of proving their acumen. Yes. And that's why I think leaders of organizations, leaders, government leaders, they need to be very aware of the lived experience of people with disabilities. How hard it is for them to, for instance, I was telling somebody, uh, the other day one particular leader asked me, he said, is it really important for me to understand lived experience of all different people? Then I said to him, I said, you see me driving this mobility scooter? If I was in an organization, I'm a self-employed person, so it's okay. But if it, I was in an organization and I wanted to carry a cup of coffee in my hand, I can't do it. I can either drive my scooter or carry my coffee. Does that mean that I don't have coffee? Or does that mean that somebody helps me with that coffee every day? Do I want that help? No, I don't. So should there be a system which helps me get that coffee without me giving up my scooter? That's the lived experience. When we when we hire and invite people with disabilities, we need to understand this lived experience. Do you also feel that companies need to uplift their uh, upskilling costs as well if they're hiring people with PWD because they might be very good at their work, but if they need to upskill and promote them to another level in order to boost their morale, then they have to shell in extra amounts and you know extra expenses in order to train them and upskill them? Yes, they do. Because uh, if you look at the Indian scenario, I don't have the exact numbers right now with me, but uh, people with qualification, people with disabilities who are highly qualified, you'll find less number. So because, because of the sheer fact that there was no accessibility in the earlier years. So keeping that in mind, if they have a certain qualification, but you want them to get into senior roles, whether it is funding them for higher education, whether it is upskilling them in the in the technical skills and also the soft skills like confidence, like positioning themselves. All of this is important. Organizations are doing it in a big way for women today. So it should not come as something new for them. Okay. Lastly, Dr. Nero, you've lived an experience of disability yourself. What is your vision of PWD in India? What is your message to anybody? <laughs> Yeah. So my message is that the sooner we normalize disability, the better it will be. And by normalizing, I mean, we don't want patronizing. You know, sometimes people with the best of intent start patronizing. Even I'm walking um, somewhere on the street and there's a footpath. Suddenly I'll find somebody holding my arm and yanking me up in, in an intent to help me. But that actually destabilizes me. Earlier, when I used to walk out of an aircraft, the air hostess would hold my hand like this, even if I didn't need it. And I was too polite to say, look, you're destabilizing. Now I'm able to say it. So we need to normalize disability and not right. look at it. We did not look at it with pity. As, some ailment. as an ailment, we need to make it as part of a process and valuable citizens who can contribute to society. And if there is an equity required to really bring up the balance, the representation and the skill set, well, we do that. All right, Dr. Nidhu, thank you so much for joining us. 
for sharing these experiences with us and the knowledge that you've shared on how should actually organizations work towards sensitization you know of their employees as well and how well they need to structure their organizations in order to welcome people from PWD segment in huge numbers so thank you so much dr neeru for joining us we highly obliged that you know we could actually be a part of your journey and hear everything that you had to say and how you actually helped in the election commission also in in providing ramps and stuff and yes the highlight it is not just the ramps that need to be made in organizations and in public booth or forums it is actually the structure that needs to be provided for them to have a seamless uh, you know walking experience so thank you so much dr neeru thank you sugand i had mentioned that we do have a summit on 13th of march at right. the lalit a partnership ask insights business world there's going to be a wealth of conversations a wealth of knowledge and i invite anybody who's listening to to this i invite you to come and attend the summit surely everybody will come now that they've heard your stories as well and they actually know what exactly the insights will also be in this forum so yeah once again i welcome everybody to please join us in the forum as well and for today thank you so much dr neeru for joining us thank you sugand thank you Thank you. Bye. Thank you.